basic airway management in cardiac arrest. Our goals and objectives for this talk? To demonstrate how to provide assistance to a person to maintain a patent airway. We'll discuss how to optimize ventilation and oxygenation in the cardiac arrest setting. We'll also discuss a few key ways to minimize risks of aspiration. The tongue is the single biggest obstruction that you will face in basic airway management. Notice on the slide that with the patient in a supine position, in the setting of a loss of protective airway reflexes, the muscles of the tongue fall backwards. They impinge along the backside of the throat and obstruct the airway. In evaluating the airway, you want to ask yourself a couple of questions. Number one, is the patient able to maintain and protect their airway? Another way to think about this is, can they open and close their airway? The second is, is the patient oxygenating and ventilating adequately? If you're able to do good bag mass ventilation with the use of airway adjuncts, particularly if the situation is temporary, you may be able to avoid intubating the patient. The best way to assess for a patent airway is to have the patient speak. If the patient can push air past their vocal cords to make a sound, then the airway is patent. If they have sonorous respirations, you can consider that to be pathologic. You want to look for any obvious signs of obstruction, large neck or body habitus, any decreased muscle tone, and in an unresponsive or apneic patient, you may need to immediately assist their airway. The primary step in basic airway management is to open the airway. In this case, you want to use a simple maneuver, such as the fish hook or jaw thrust. The head lift chin tilt is contraindicated in trauma, and studies demonstrate that it doesn't sufficiently open up the airway and pull the tongue off the back of the throat. However, these simple maneuvers do. Let's look at this in a video. Okay, so I'm approaching the patient's head, standing at the head of the bed for airway management. I'm going to remove the pillow to optimize their positioning. I do give a little head lift here. And I'm just grabbing underneath the mandible and lifting up towards the sky. That's a fish hook. This is a jaw thrust. With the jaw thrust, my fingers are grabbing behind the angle of the mandible and lifting towards the ceiling. If the patient isn't spontaneously breathing after you've opened the airway, you want to initiate bag mass ventilation. At all times, if you have two providers available, you want to do two-man bag mass ventilation. Always consider placing an airway adjunct. Nasopharyngeal airways and oropharyngeal airways can get you out of a lot of troublesome situations. You can ventilate well over 95% of the population with bilateral MPAs and the placement of an OPA. The only contraindication to their use is bleeding disorders with regard to the nasopharyngeal airway, or NPA. And for the oropharyngeal airway, or OPA, it's contraindicated in patients with an intact gag reflex. If your airway adjuncts don't work, if your bag mass ventilation is still inadequate, you want to consider an extra glottic device, or an EGD, such as the King LT, the LMA, or the Comba tube. If all of those efforts have failed, consider intubation. Let's insert an MPA. So we're going to measure from the patient's mouth to the earlobe. Notice the bevel at the distal part of the MPA. That's facing towards the patient's septum. We're just going to insert this with a little bit of, of lubrication on the MPA. This slips behind the back of the tongue and allows me to provide increased ventilation to the patient. With an OPA insertion, I'm measuring from the angle of the mandible to the mouth. I'm going to grab the mouth and take control of the tongue with a little fish hook. Notice how I put the OPA in backwards first and then twisted it at 180 degrees to help get over the base of the tongue. With bag mass ventilation, it's important to remember that a good seal is paramount. A good seal will overcome increased resistance and decreased compliance. If you're not getting adequate chest rise and fall, you want to look and listen and feel for a mask leak. You can rock the mask back and forth and from side to side. Some masks will allow you to add or remove air from the balloon that supplies air to the mask to improve the seal. You can also try reapplying a jaw thrust. Let's look at single provider bag mask ventilation. So I'm going to use a C and E technique with my left hand. So my thumb and index finger form a C, other fingers form an E. The C is used to place the mask over the face. The E is used to pull the jaw into the mask. Note how I said pull the jaw into the mask. It's tempting to push down, but that may obstruct the airway and push the tongue back. And now I can ventilate the patient with my right hand and look for adequate chest rise and fall. Again, if you feel that this is inadequate, the solution to poor bagging is better bagging. Reposition the patient. You may want to ramp up their shoulders and place a series of blankets or sheets under their shoulders to improve their axes. You can also reapply a jaw thrust. Don't forget about the airway adjuncts. In this case, if you're having difficulty, you want to have a bilateral placement of nasopharyngeal airways and an oropharyngeal airway. If you have two providers, you want to use a two-handed mask seal. You can consider placing an extra glottic device or intubating the patient. 
Let's talk briefly about improving the seal on the mask. We'll talk about the two thumbs up technique and watch a video here shortly. If the patient has extra soft tissue around the face, you can consider taking the, their cheeks and kind of wrapping them up around the mask to help improve the seal. And in this case, you want to leave dentures in place. So dentures in for bagging, dentures out for intubation. The dentures help to improve the mask seal by giving an extra set of resistance for the mask to lean upon, as opposed to the patient's gums and soft tissue. So let's demonstrate two-man bagging with the parallel thumbs technique. So I'm going to take the mask here and use my thumbs and the thinner eminences of my thumbs to push the mask onto the face while I'm pulling the jaw up into the mask with all four fingers of both hands. You can even rock back and just pull the jaw into the mask in this case. A second provider is providing the ventilation. Ventilation strategies in cardiac arrest are fairly simple and straightforward. If you're a lone rescuer responding to an unresponsive patient, Check for a pulse, and if they don't have a pulse, you should focus on providing continuous chest compressions rather than ventilations. Recall that C, circulation, comes before A, airway, and B, breathing, in this case. Once help arrives, you can initiate ventilations when a bag valve mask becomes available. Ideally, you'll have two people focused on the airway at the head of the bed, with other people providing CPR. Evidence points towards lower oxygen requirements during the cardiac arrest state. In fact, high concentrations of oxygen promote free radical formation and may be toxic to lung tissue. Positive pressure ventilation can also impede cardiac output and decrease the venous return to the heart. This can actually inhibit all the progress you're making with chest compression. So you want to focus on a low tidal volume strategy for your ventilations. So just to reinforce that, uh, while you're performing continuous chest compressions, you want to try to interpose unsynchronized ventilations in this case. So every five to six seconds, as the person providing CPR comes up off the chest, you want to try to deliver a short tidal volume breath. Consider using a pediatric ambu bag in this case, which contains a 500 milliliter reservoir, as opposed to the large adult ambu bag that contains a liter reservoir. We're looking here on the order of about five mils per kilo for the patient. In this case, we're abandoning the ACLS protocol of 30 compressions to two ventilatory breaths with CPR pauses in order to try to maximize our compression fraction. If you have extra hands, cricoid pressure can be maintained by yet a third provider to minimize gastric insufflation, but you want to reinforce the point that cricoid pressure isn't going to help prevent aspiration during active vomiting. Okay, let's discuss the last couple of points on respiratory care in cardiac arrest. You want to avoid long pauses for intubation. A good airway manager should be able to intubate the patient successfully during active chest compressions without long pauses. A short, less than 10 second pause is okay if you're just trying to pass the tube in that case, but you want to avoid the one to two minute looking at the airway, passing the tube, reattempting to pass the tube, successfully passing the tube, inflating the cuff, assessing for correct tube placement that delays the definitive treatment of the patient in a pulseless state, which is continuous chest compressions. Once the tube has been placed, you want to continue ventilatory breaths every five to six seconds. It's not quite as important in this case to deliver them with the chest recoil, but if you can, it's a good idea because now we're trying to avoid breath stacking and again to decrease positive pressure ventilation and impaired venous return. You want to place an inline end tidal carbon dioxide detector as soon as possible in a code situation. You can do this between the mask and the bag, or you can do it between the endotracheal tube and the bag. But in any case, getting this on is important for assessing adequacy of your ventilation, adequacy of CPR, and return of spontaneous circulation, as is discussed in the cardiocerebral resuscitation lecture. Extraglottic devices, in this case we're trying to transfer the seal from the face to an extraglottic location. Anybody with skills in basic airway management can place one of these devices. The laryngeal mask airway is one example of an extraglottic device that can be placed blindly. The balloon is passed into the patient's mouth, the tip inserts into the proximal esophagus, the cuff is then inflated, and the balloon inflates and provides some measure of protection of aspiration of gastric contents. Newer models have additional features to help minimize the aspiration risk. The advantage of this insertion is that you don't need to manipulate the head or the mandible in order to provide an airtight seal. Most LMAs also have a space to allow for G-tube insertion to allow you to decompress the stomach and to remove gastric contents. The King LT is another extraglottic device that can be placed blindly. In this case, the tube is passed into the proximal esophagus. The King LT has two balloons that are inflated simultaneously with a single cuff. You want to inflate this with a large syringe, and you want to watch the tube elevate towards the ceiling to confirm placement. Between the balloons, there are ports that allow for passive ventilation. Let's look at a King LT insertion. So I'm going to open the patient's airway up here, place the King LT until it's seated, use a large syringe. In this case, a 60 mil syringe would have been better. You could use a smaller one if that's all you have. And notice as I inflate that the 
tube is elevating towards the ceiling. Let's just focus on the tube to see what's happening there. So again, inflating the tube, tube's rising towards the ceiling, and that rise indicates that it's placed in the correct position. This concludes the lecture on basic airway management and cardiac arrest. Thanks to the media production team at the Center for Health and Technology and the Center for Virtual Care for their assistance in this production.